Hello there, and welcome to the series on linear algebra, where we're going to be focusing on the concepts associated to vectors, matrices, linear transformations, and some applications associated to these three objects. In this video, we're going to be focusing on the concept of a vector and some of the properties associated to them. To begin, let us consider a point A, B in two-dimensional space. And let's actually generate a graph that is associated to this. So let this be the x-axis, this be the y-axis, and let this be the point A, B. So a vector is an object that has some particular length that points in the particular vector or the particular direction of this point. So let's assume that we want some vector of length L. So let's assume that this distance is length equal to L. And this vector, let's assume this vector's name is U, points in some particular direction. For example, if it has this direction, it has a base point of the origin, some other directions would be, of course, that direction, that direction, that direction, or those directions as well. But in particular, if we want some particular vector in this direction of AB with this particular length, technically that vector would also work, or this vector down here would also work as well. As long as it's pointing towards that particular point AB and it has the same exact length, technically they are the same vector. So how do we represent a point or a vector that has this particular direction and that particular length? So we represent that vector as U. Some people will put a little vector symbol above it and that's gonna be equal to AB, where that point AB represents the end point if you were to use the base point as the origin. And we're going to be representing the location of where all these two dimensional points are as R2. So what exactly is this R2? So an informal interpretation, it is a place where all two dimensional real valued vectors live. Later we're going to be calling R2 a vector space or a two-dimensional vector space, but for now you need to just think of R2 as the place where all two-dimensional real valued vectors live. So what characteristics make a vector unique? So a vector u, some people will also just represent it with u with that little fancy symbol on top, has two characteristics, so it has two characteristics associated to it. So as I've already mentioned, the very first characteristic is the length or the magnitude of that vector. So the magnitude is the length of that vector. The length of the vector. So the length of the vector, one could imagine, is the distance from the origin to its endpoint, or its directional components. In that first example I gave up here, that would be AB, and that is endpoint. Endpoint. Okay, so to give it a little bit more of a formal definition, so let us assume u is the vector that has real valued components x1, x2, down to xn. So this is an n-dimensional vector, so it lives in Rn. So the magnitude of this particular vector, which we denote with double bars on both sides of it, so that's going to denote the magnitude of u, can be found via the multidimensional Pythagorean theorem to be equal to the sum of the squares of its components. So x1 squared plus x2 squared, if it's two-dimensional, plus all the way out down to the last component squared. So let's just give a little numerical example just in case you're not comfortable with the formalities. So let's assume we choose a vector u to be equal to negative four, seven. So this is of course a two-dimensional vector. So what is the magnitude of this vector, some people call it the norm of the vector as well. That's going to be equal to the square of negative 4 plus the square of 7. So that's going to be the square of 16 plus 49. So that's going to be equal to the square root of 65, which you can find to be approximately equal to 8.06. So that's what we call the magnitude or norm of that two-dimensional vector, negative 4, 7. So the second characteristic 
for vectors will be the direction. So the direction of a vector is the angle theta, and usually people let theta be only in the range from minus pi to pi in radians, or you can represent that in degrees as minus 180 degrees to positive 180 degrees, inclusive on the positive boundary, not inclusive on the negative boundary. So it's the angle theta that the vector u makes with respect to the positive horizontal, or some people say the x axis. Now, when we start working in higher dimensions, for example, 3D, 4D, and 5D, we're going to need to change this direction up just a tad bit, but generally speaking, this answer still is, this definition is still going to hold. So let's look at the 2D picture just to get some basic intuition of what's going on here. So in 2D, our picture looks like this. So x, y, and let's assume that this is our vector u. And this angle, so technically this is the uh, horizontal component, I'm going to call it A. This is the vertical component, B. So that means U is the vector AB. The angle that it makes with the respect to the horizontal axis, that would be this angle here. So this angle, or the direction of that vector, is sometimes called the argument of the vector. So angle is sometimes called the argument of u, the argument of the vector. And sometimes we abbreviate that by a, r, g. So the argument of u, this vector, can be viewed as a trigonometric problem because if we want to find that value theta from the basic trigonometric functions, we know that the tangent of theta is going to be equal to opposite over adjacent. So if we take the inverse tangent of both sides, that gives us a nice uh, formulaic representation of this. So that means this is going to be equal to the arc tangent of the vertical component divided by the horizontal component. Sometimes people will write that as uy divided by ux. And some people will also emphasize that this is the x argument because we're focusing on the horizontal positive x axis. So let's just do a little numerical example just to see if we understand how to do that. So if we have a vector v, and let's assume that this vector is 3 minus 4, then the argument with respect to x of v is going to be equal to the arc tangent of the vertical component divided by the horizontal component. So using a calculator, you can find that this is equal to approximately negative 0.93 radians. Or if you want to convert that to degrees, that's actually very easy. So we're just going to set up a little ratio. So we want to get rid of radians, and we want to convert this to degrees. And we know that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. So here, our radians will cancel, leaving us with an answer in degrees. And that's going to come out to approximately negative 53.13 degrees. So if we look at the graph of this particular vector v, so that's going to be this vector here. So this is going to be minus four, that's gonna be equal to three. And this angle here, that is 53.13 degrees in the clockwise direction. That's what negative 53.13 degrees represents. So let's just make a quick note, uh, just in case you have ever thought about this or you may encounter this question in the future. But the location of the endpoint. So the location of the endpoint does not necessarily, or the base point rather, or the base point of a vector does not, you could define a vector in terms of its base point and endpoint if you really want to, but it generally does not define a vector. Only its magnitude and 
direction, at least from the classical definition of a vector. So let's look at a particular vector. So let's assume u is the vector 1, 1, very basic looking vector. So traditionally, people think of the vector 1, 1 as this structure here, u, right? where that is 1 and that is 1. But that's not necessarily where u has to be, because technically the base point can be over here somewhere, right? So for example, this point can be the point 7 comma 10. And as long as that angle is the same, for example, 45 degrees is the angle of 1, 1. And as long as that length is 1, that means this endpoint needs to be 8 comma 11, that's still the vector u. So u is not unique to its location, it's only unique of its direction and its magnitude. So technically u can be hanging out down here. So as long as that, dis that angle is 45 degrees, so for example, if that's negative seven, negative four, then that means its endpoint would be negative uh, six. Well, technically that doesn't really make sense. That should be a positive seven. So if that's a positive seven, then that means this point should be eight comma negative three, right? So u, again, is not unique based on its endpoint and base point, but rather its direction and magnitude. So just keep those basic things in mind. So the next concept that I want to define is a unit vector. So a unit vector is just a vector whose magnitude is equal to one. So as a first example, let us assume that u is the vector three, two. So what would the magnitude of u be in this particular case? So the magnitude of u is gonna be equal to the square root of three squared plus two squared, which is gonna be equal to the square root of nine plus four, which is going to be equal to the square root of 13. So the square root of 13 does not equal to one, therefore u is not a unit vector. Nextly, let us assume that we have another vector v. So let v be equal to the vector square root of two over two and square root of two over two as its uh, other component. So if this is my vector v, what would be its magnitude? So the magnitude of v is gonna be equal to the square root of square root of two over two squared plus square root of two over two squared. And that's gonna be equal to the square root of one fourth, uh, two fourths. It's gonna be the square root of two fourths plus two fourths, which is gonna be the square root of four fourths, which is going to be one. So since the magnitude of v is equal to one, that means v is a unit vector. Unit vectors are gonna be very commonly used in a lot of the applications we deal with later. So at least just know of its definition and what it means in order for it to be a unit vector. It just means the magnitude is one. Let's introduce another function that you're going to see in periodic uh, cases throughout this series. And that's gonna be the Kronecker, the Kronecker delta function. So the Kronecker delta function is a multivariable function that either takes one or zero depending on where you are. So we denote the Kronecker delta function delta ij, and some people will write it as delta i comma j, sort of like f of x comma y. This is going to be equal to one if i is equal to j, and it's gonna be zero if i does not equal to j. So some basic examples of its calculation. If you see delta three, two, what's this gonna be equal to? So since three and two are not equal to each other, that's going to be equal to zero. If you see delta seven, five, that's also gonna be equal to zero. If you see delta eight, eight, that's gonna be equal to one and so on. Again, this is just a little special function that we're going to be using to shorthand a lot of the proofs and calculations that we do later on. Now, another thing that I want to define is a special unit vector. So we're going to let ik be a particular n-dimensional vector in Rn. So ik is not just gonna be any vector in Rn, but it's gonna be this particular vector. So it's gonna be a vectors with a bunch of zeros and one, where one 
is located in the kth component. So ik is an n-dimensional vector, n-dimensional vector with all zeros, with all zeros, except for a one in position k. This is going to be a very, very important type of vector. So let's just look at a couple examples just to make sure you understand. So if we look in the vector space R2, I1 is going to be equal to 1, 0. I2 is going to be equal to 0, 1. So in R2, there are only two of these vectors, I, K, where K ranges from 1 to 2. If we look in R3, there's going to be three of these vectors. So I1 is going to be equal to 1, 0, 0. I2 is going to be the vector 0, 1, 0. And I3 is going to be vector 0, 0, 1. So you should be able to prove that for all n in the natural numbers, so 1, 2, 3, 4, up to infinity, I, K is always a unit vector. Right? It's a it's a nice little unit vector, I mean, compared to that other unit vector that I gave way up here, this one. Yes, it is a unit vector, but it's not that nice looking. And of course, nice is a subjective adjective here. But here, these unit vectors are very, very easy to construct, and they're going to represent something very, very special later on. But just keep these things in mind about unit vectors, the Kronecker delta function, and these what eventually are going to be called the uh, standard basis vectors. Um, but we're going to get into basis vectors a little bit later. Just know that these vectors ik are very, very special. Now that we have some of the basic terminology discussed in terms of vectors, now I want to go ahead and talk about operations between two or more vectors. So the very first operation that we're going to be discussing is what is referred to as scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication. So the first thing that we need to define is a scalar. So scalar is, I guess some people can just view as just a special little number. Not really special, but just a number. So let k be a scalar or let k be a real number. You can let k be a complex number if you want. And let us assume u is a vector and n-dimensional vector space. So we have two characters here. We have k, which is a scalar, and u, which is a vector. So we need to define what do we mean by multiplying scalars and vectors together, i.e. what is scalar multiplication. So then scalar multiplication, scalar multiplication, i.e. the multiplication of vectors with scalars, is defined by so if we have k times the vector u, or in expanded terms, k times x1, x2 down to xn, we're going to define this by multiplying each of the components of the vector u by that particular scalar k. So this is going to be kx1, kx2, all the way down to k x, m. So we define scalar multiplication by multiplying the scalar times each of the components of that particular vector. Let's look at a particular numerical example to make sure you understand. So if we have negative 3 times the vector 5, 3, minus 1 via this definition, then this vector result should be negative 15, minus 9, and 3. So that's the resultant vector. So one very useful theorem so theorem, let's call this theorem one, is that the norm of KU is equal to the absolute value of that scalar times the norm of the vector U without that scalar factor brought into it. Here, K again is a scalar and U is an n-dimensional vector. So how can you go about proving this particular theorem? So proof. So what is the norm of KU represent? So that's going to be the norm of kx1, kx2, down to kxm. So by the definition of norms, that's going to be equal to the square root of 
kx1, the quantity squared, plus kx2, the quantity squared, all the way down to kxn, the quantity squared. And I can distribute that square over the product of each of those terms. So that's going to be equal to the square root of k squared x1 squared plus k2, or k squared x2 squared, all the way down to k squared xn squared. Notice that each of these terms has a k squared in it, so I can factor them out. So that's going to be equal to the square root of k squared times x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way down to xn squared. And notice I can take the square root of this term and that term, and we know that the square root of k squared is going to be the absolute value of k. So that's the absolute value of k times the square root of the remaining term plus all the way down to xn squared. And what is this? Well, that's just the norm of u without the scalar factor. So that means this is going to be equal to the absolute value of k times the norm of u. And that's the norm of ku. So we've proven that result. So what exactly does this theorem give us? Well, it gives us an interpretation of what scalar multiplication actually does. So that means scalar multiplication Scalar multiplication can do two things. The first is it stretches or shrinks vectors. For example, if k is larger than 1, it makes it longer. If k is between 0 and 1, it makes it a little bit smaller. Or it rotates the vector by 180 degrees if k is a negative number. So if you multiply a vector by negative 1, it simply rotates it by 180 degrees. So that's some basic things associated to scalar multiplication. Another theorem that is actually pretty interesting, uh, but technically only applies to the two-dimensional case, is the following theorem. So let's call this theorem 2. So the argument of KU is equal to the argument of u, provided that k, again, is a positive real number, and u is a two-dimensional vector, because we've only technically defined uh, arguments in two dimensions. So how can you prove this particular result? So the proof of this is actually quite easy. So if, k, if u is a two-dimensional vector, that means u looks something like a, b. So that means KU is going to be equal to KA, KB. So what is the argument of KU? So the argument of KU is just going to be equal to the arc tangent of the vertical component KB divided by the horizontal component KA. Notice here that since K is a positive number, that's not equal to zero, so they can cancel out without any difficulties. So this is just going to equal the arc tangent of the horizontal component divided by I mean the vertical component divided by the horizontal component of vector u, but that's precisely the definition of the argument of u alone. Right? So therefore, if you stretch it or shrink it, it's still in the same direction, and you can sort of verify that in your mind. For example, if you have a vector u located here, and you multiply it by some k bigger than 1, for example, ku, where k is bigger than 1, then that's going to give us... Um, a longer vector, but still the direction is the same, right? Now notice here I'm making sure that k is a positive number because if k is a negative number, then it's going to be there, there, or something shorter than what it used to be. But in the other direction, therefore the angle is a little bit different. And you can sort of think about what the relation is between theta and the new argument if you so wish to. So the next operation that I want to explore secondary to scalar multiplication is what is referred to as vector addition. So vector addition. So we're going to be choosing two vectors in n dimensions. So let u and v both be vectors in n dimensional space. So vector addition, so vector addition is defined by the following. So u plus v, so where u and v are vectors, 
So what is u? Well, u is just x1, x2 down to say xm. And let's call v the vector y1, y2 down to ym. So this sum is going to be defined by the sum of its corresponding dimensional components. So the first match with the first, the second match with the second, and so on. So we're going to define vector addition via x1 plus y1 x2 plus y2 all the way down to xm plus ym. Now it's very important to notice that since u and v are both vectors in Rn, this also is going to be an element of Rn as well. Therefore the dimension of the resulting vector when you add or subtract two vectors is still going to be in Rm. So let's just do a quick numerical example just to make sure you understand. So let's assume we have the vector negative 5, 3, Add it to the vector 7, 5. From this definition, you should see that that should be equal to negative 5 plus 7 and 3 plus 5 for the secondary component, which should be equal to 2, 8. And again, that is an R2, just like the first two vectors were. Now let's look at a geometric perspective of vector addition, because this is actually pretty interesting. Let's see a geometric perspective of vector addition. So let's just choose a couple vectors. Let's let u be equal to 4, 1, and let's let v be equal to 1, 2. So that means u plus v is going to be the vector 5, 3. So let's look at these vectors where all of their base points are based on 0, 0. So this is my horizontal axis, vertical axis. So u, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1. So this is going to be u. Let's look at v now. So v is 1, 2. So if we go up two units, this is going to be equal to the vector v. And where is 5, 3? So 5, 3 is going to be uh, somewhere over here. So this is the vector u plus v. Now remember, vectors are not unique based upon their base points or endpoints, but rather their magnitude and direction. So even though my vector v is shaded in blue, technically this vector here is also the vector v, and also this vector here is the vector u. Notice that they both have the same exact direction. For example, if I look at um, the vector in blue, that's still theta, and this angle can be shown to be still equal to theta. If I look at my pink vectors, one can show that that still is like some angle phi, and this angle still is some angle phi, so the angles and the magnitudes are all equal to each other, but notice that they form a parallelogram. So this is actually a very important observation. So that means u plus v, the resultant vector, is a diagonal of the parallelogram parallelogram formed from, not formed, but formed, formed from u and v. And that's a very important observation. Now, it's also important to note that u plus v and v plus u are always equal to each other. But it's not just any diagonal, but it's this primary diagonal here. So if this is u and this is v, again, this is u, and that is, again, uh, that's v, sorry. So that's v, and that's u. That u plus v is this diagonal here. It's not the other one, right? So maybe you want to think about, well, which vector is that one on the other diagonal? I'll leave you that question there. Now let us look at the third operation between vectors that is very important. So the third important operation between vectors is what is referred to as dot products. So we have addition, subtraction, multiplication by scalars. What about vectors with vectors? So dot products is the first um, operation that sort of deals with that. So again, we're going to be letting u and v be vectors in the same exact uh, vector space, Rm, so they have the same exact dimension. If you do not have vectors with the same exact dimension, then you cannot at least necessarily, do the dot product between them. So we're going to be defining, so we're going to define the dot product, which we're going to write as u dot v. This is going to be defined as the sum from k is equal to 1 to n that I mentioned of the components multiplied together. So this is going to be equal to x1, y1, 
plus x2, y2, all the way down to xn, yn, and that is the dot product between vectors x and y, or the dot product between vectors uh, u and v. Now it's very important to notice that we have a vector, dot product with another vector, but this is not a vector, it is a scalar. So the dot product of vectors do not give you another vector, it gives you just a number. So let's look at a basic example to sort of see, okay, well how we how do we do that for just a numerical example? So if I have the vector negative 5, 3, dot product with 7, negative 4, that's going to be equal to x1 times y1 plus x2 times y2. So that's going to be negative 35 plus negative 12, which is going to be negative 47. So that's the dot product between these two vectors. Now, what does the dot product mean? We'll get into that a little bit later. So let's look at a very special relationship uh, between those vectors i, k that I talked about before. So let's observe the following. So let's let i, j and i, k both be vectors in Rm, be the special unit vectors, unit vectors defined before. Okay, where you have zeros everywhere except the j and k uh, locations respectively. Right? So what is the dot product between these two vectors? So if I have ij dot product with ik, what is that going to be equal to? So if I do ij, what is ij? So ij is going to be equal to 0, 0, down to 1, down to 0, where this 1 is in the jth position. And then I'm going to dot product that with the next vector ik. So it's going to be 0, 0, down to 1, down to 0. And where is this particular 1? So 1 is going to be in the kth position. So if I do the dot product between these vectors, if they're in the same exact position, they're only going to line up as 1 times 1 in that particular equal position, where all of the other ones are going to be 0. So it's going to be a bunch of zeros plus 1 plus a bunch of zeros, which is going to be 1, if they're in the same exact position. But if they're in different positions, for example, if the 1 is here and the 1 is there, then 1 times 0 is 0, 0 times 1 is 0, and 0 times 0, and all of the other positions are going to be 0 as well, which is going to give us 0. So that means this is going to be equal to 0 if j does not equal to k, and 1 if j is equal to k. And this little function should look familiar because that's just the Kronecker delta function. So that means the unit vectors ij dot product with ik is actually equal to the delta function evaluated at jk. And that's a very important thing to keep in mind and is actually going to help us prove a theorem later on. Now, before we get into the last couple of theorems that I want to discuss today, I just want to make a connection between dot product and the multiplication of binomials that we discussed, um, say, back in pre-calculus. So here's a guiding question. Is dot products, or are dot products, rather, so are dot products related to multiplication of polynomials. And this is going to be a very interesting thing because one could ask is, well, why do we define dot products in this particular way? And this is one of the natural reasons why we actually want to do so. So let's, so let's actually look at the same exact example as we did before. So let's look at negative 5, 3, dot product with 7 minus 4. And let's actually represent each of these vectors with respect to the special vectors in R2, for example, 1, 0, and 0, 1. So the negative 5, 3 vector can be represented as vector addition and scalar multiplication in the following way, because we can represent that as negative 5, the scalar, times the vector 1, 0, plus 3 times the vector 0, 1. And this other vector, 7, negative 4, can also be represented in a similar way. That's going to be 7 times the vector 1, 0, plus negative 4 times the vector 0, 1. Right? So we've represented these two dimensional vectors uh, with respect to these special vectors 1, 0, and 0, 1. 
So if this is just standard um, multiplication, say in polynomials, technically we can FOIL these things. So we can distribute that to there, and then that to there, and then similar, we can distribute that to here, and that to there. And let's actually see what that comes out to, and you're actually going to see something very, very beautiful. So that's going to be equal to negative 5 times 7, and then we're going to have 1, 0 times 1, 0. And then we're going to have negative 5 times negative 4, and then we're going to have 1, 0, 0, 1. And then the orange color comes, and that's 3 times 7, 0, 1, 1, 0. And then finally, 3 times minus 4, and that's going to be 0, 1, 0, 1. Let's look at our scalars here. So negative 5 times 7, that's going to be equal to negative 35. And then we have the dot product between 1, 0, and 1, 0. That's just going to be equal to 1. Then we have negative 5 times negative 4, that's going to be positive 20. Then the dot product between 1, 0, and 0, 1, that's going to be equal to 0. Then we have 21. Then the dot product between those vectors, that's going to be 0. Then 3 times minus 4, that's going to be minus 12. And then the dot product between 0, 1, and 0, 1, that's just going to be equal to 1. So notice that our inner terms, 0, 0, those are just going to disappear. And we're just going to be left with negative 35 plus negative 12, which is going to be negative 47, which gives us the same exact answer as we did before. So definitely there is a deep connection between multiplication of polynomials and this definition of dot product that we have introduced. Therefore, it does seem natural that this is what we should define the dot products between vectors to be. Now with those things said, let's look at a couple other theorems um, between vectors that are going to be extremely important later on. So the third theorem that I want to introduce actually connects dot products with norms. And this is actually a pretty interesting theorem. Right? So this theorem says the following, that the dot product of a vector with itself is actually equal to the square of its magnitude. And here, u can be any vector in Rm. So let's go ahead and prove this theorem because this is actually pretty interesting. And we're going to be using this a little bit later on. So how to prove this? So the dot product with u with itself, we actually already have a definition because keep in mind that's x1, x2 down to xm, dot product with x1, x2 down to xm. And what is this? So we're gonna do x1 times x1 plus x2 times x2 plus all the way down to xn times xn. So that's gonna be equal to x1 squared plus x2 squared all the way down to xn squared. So what exactly is that? Well, technically we can square root that and then square that result and that should give us the same exact answer. So this is equivalent. And what is the square root of the sum of the squares? Well, that's technically the norm squared, which completes the proof of that result. So that's actually quite easy to prove. Now the next theorem is very important when you start doing some algebra with dot products. So theorem five is that u, time, u dot v and v dot u are always equal to each other. And this is gonna be true for all vectors u, v, both being part of the same exact vector space, Rm. And I leave you this proof to do as an exercise. It's actually not too difficult because uh, multiplication between real numbers is commutative, so you should be able to use that result uh, to prove that the dot product between real valued vectors also is commutative. Another theorem uh, that is actually pretty useful is the following. So theorem six is that the dot product between two vectors is always less than or equal to the product of the magnitudes of these two vectors. This, this theorem is sometimes referred to as the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And again, I leave this proof to you as an exercise. So the dot product is always less than or equal to the product of the magnitudes. That has a couple interesting consequences, where one of them is the following theorem. So the norm of the sum is actually not equal to the sum of the norms. That's very, very important, at least not in all cases. But the norm of the sum is always less than or equal to the sum of the norms or the sum of the magnitudes. And this is often referred to as the triangle inequality. The triangle inequality for the magnitude of vectors. So let's go ahead and see if we can prove this by using the Cauchy-Schwartz as a tool. 
So let's look at the square of the norm. So the norm of the sum squared. That's going to get rid of the um, squares. So remember, the square of the norm from this other theorem that we showed is the same as the dot product between those two vectors. So the square of the norm of u plus v can be represented as u plus v dot product with u plus v. And one can show via that sort of distribution trick that this is actually the same as u dot u plus u dot v plus v dot u plus v dot v. Okay? Also remember that from that theorem that you're going to prove that u dot v and v dot u are the same exact thing and the dot product of a vector with itself is the same as the square of the norms. That means this is the same as u squared plus 2 u dot v plus magnitude v squared. Now, from the Cauchy-Swartz inequality, remember that the dot product between two vectors is always less than or equal to less than or equal to the norm products. So that's going to be norm u squared plus 2 norm of u, norm of v, plus norm of v squared. So I'm focusing on this particular inequality. And since that is the case, technically this is an expanded binomial expression. So that means this is the same as the norm of u plus the norm of v, the quantity squared. So what I've shown here is that this expression is less than or equal to the norm of u plus v, the quantity squared. Now that I have this expression, I can take the square root, and the inequality between them stays the same. Therefore, I have proven that the norm of u plus v is less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v, and that is the triangle inequality proven. So I hope you enjoyed this introduction to vectors, which is definitely one of the very important tools that we're going to be using in this linear algebra series. So in the next video, we're going to be discussing some special relations between vectors in multiple dimensions. And then after that, we're going to go into matrices and some special properties associated to that. So I hope to see you there. Take care. Mm -hmm.